Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us again for another day of fun science. We're starting with something a little bit different today. Yesterday was a lot of models. Today, we're going to talk a little bit more about data, where data comes from, and data governance. And today, to kick us off, we have Dr. Christy Cottle, who is a postdoc in sort of two programs, right? You're sort of in Ottawa and you're attached to Trent, and you're doing a lot of things, but she has some really interesting things to say and a perspective that's quite different to what we've been seeing so far. And so I'm not going to belabor the point. I would just like you to tell us all about what it is you work on. Thank you. Thanks so much. So I will introduce myself. I thought I'd just uh, put up a couple slides to, to preface what we're going to be talking about. And yeah, thank you for that, Wesley. Thank you for having me. Um, yeah, we've been talking a lot about modeling so far, pretty heavy. In the, in the data as we do as scientists. And of course, you know, incredible progress has been made on the, the science that we do and how to action that on the ground, really informing complex environmental problems um, for many different applications. Um, and of course, a lot of this has to do from my personal work with high resolution uh, satellite data to inform environmental trends. You know, we have this terabyte cloud computing that happens, AI supported statistical cloud computing. Um, so we have this real granularity for um, natural assets and decision making. But as as we all know, you know, despite despite this, um, there have been reports uh, indicating, and we all know pretty intuitively that despite these commitments to build resilience and um, all of the impetus behind our science and the modeling that we do, tackling climate change, um, creating these sustainable pathways, um, the current societal, political, and economic choices that um, are being made are doing the reverse. So we're all living in this pretty intimately, right? Um, and what I'm here to talk about today is something like systems thinking. And system thinking provides us with this sort of work that allows us to get outside of what we're doing and really ask some questions about why, how are we couched in a particular worldview? Why are we doing what we're doing? Um, what does that mean for actionable science on the ground? What does that mean for environmental justice? What does that mean for equity? And how can we start to constellate to different ways of knowing and being um, to really action what it is that we do? So, um, <laughs> yeah, this is me really geeking out with, uh, with Mars Rover. My background is in space sciences and systems engineering. Um, and that really taught me to, and I'm such, a, yeah, I'm such a nerd for geology too. Like I love, just love being, being with the rocks and um, working in space, space sciences, space data. And in systems engineering, that really taught me to look at the sky as a matrix um, through deep space and time with this breadth and depth. Um, and this is one photo with the Mars 2020 rover. Um, and I helped lead the first uh, field systems team for, um, for all of the subsystems on that rover to do mock, mock tests to get ready for space flight. Um, and as systems engineer, sometimes, you know, you act as project managers, you have to understand the big picture strategies of a mission general operations. And sometimes you act as a technical expert. You're sort of helping to inform and relate information between subsystems teams. You have to sort of work quickly on your feet, make really sound decisions, and think about all of the solutions that are available and how do they fit elegantly together. Um, but really what I learned is that this is all about the metacognition of scientists. It's really stepping back and thinking, how do people think and why do they make the decisions that they make? Um, when you have lots of different people from different kinds of teams trying to work together with different roles. Um, and often the answer is inertia. Uh, people just tend to just keep plowing forward, um, aware of it or not. So yeah, pretty, a guiding question for me uh, has, has really always been, why do we do what we do? And I like to, um, to have this uh, slide, this is Jane Goodall on the left, and this is me, a few images of me on the right. Um, like many of us, as a scientist, uh, I, I really became interested in being a scientist because I wanted to know more about the world. I wanted to understand it. 
And this is the path of modernity to understand our natural world. We are we're given these tools through science. Um, and like these experiences that Jane describes here, um, I realized that my capacity to understand the natural world through solely scientific method, methods and what my culture had given to me, those conceptualizations of the world were actually quite limited. Um, and I love this quote that she wrote in a memoir. She talks about this really fundamental experience that she had that framed the work in her life. Um, she says, it seems to me, uh, this experience that she had in the Gombe forest, the self was utterly absent. I and the chimpanzees and the earth and the trees and the air seem to merge and become one with the spirit of power of life itself. So this just, um, this really makes me think more about uh, after I had similar experiences, uh, I had this sort of reckoning actually a couple of years in my life where I thought, okay, what, what science are we actually doing? Why are we doing this? When we find the world in the state that it's in, um, what are we doing to really action on change? And what, it, what is the gaps? And I think this is something that sits really heavily with a lot of scientists. What are the gaps between the science that we do and change actually being made? So this is a quote from Gregory Bateson. He is um, pretty fundamental for me. He's a cyberneticist. If you're not familiar with him, I highly recommend a technologist. I really recommend steps to an ecology of the mind. Um, and he says, you know, this is paraphrased, but faced with an impossible scenario, you're forced to revolutionize the way you think in order to move on. And he suggests that, that more and more purely technological solutions um, won't meet the world's problems because the major problems in the world, he says, um, result from the difference between how nature works and how people think. And I think he's referring to people in modernity. So any attempt to put things right, with more technological interventions, as much as we, we want to do this, may manifest in the same kind of wrong headedness. And what he says is that we're an ontological runaway train without moral checks and balances. So we'll talk a lot about ontology um, in this talk, and um, because Bateson, his research and practice was freely guided by an ontology of becoming, identifying change, difference, relationships as basic elements, um, you know, observing science and technology from a place of metacognition, from understanding how we are couched in our systems. So um, for many centuries, uh, the term ontology is referred to a branch of philosophy. It deals with the nature of being, um, what constitutes reality. Um, and of course, uh, these are philosophical and cognitive questions about how we conceptualize or categorize the world. This is known as our worldview. In the last few decades, there's a new definition of ontology that's been added to our lexicon. And this is of course in information science. A formal ontology refers to explicit or machine readable, a formal representation of concepts and categories um, in any particular subject area or about the World Wide Web in general, which we'll talk about too. So both uh, philosophical and formal ontology, of course, are intimately related um, and they both deal with how we conceptualize the world, but the formal ontology um, is specific to computer environments. We'll talk about why that's important. Um, semantics, uh, again, it's a branch of this complex linguistics, philosophy, logic, computer science, and it has to deal with meaning. What are the meanings of words? What does that really mean? Um, and ontologies are this formal, complex set of standards that help computers understand semantics. They help commuter, computers understand what are the meanings of words? What do we mean? We say that and what are the complex relationships between those words so that um, computers can read meaning this is a lot of this is probably not new to any of you um, and then we talk about geospatial ontologies because my background and a lot of us are interested in space and place uh, and the challenge in producing big data or big earth data specifically is really in semantic um, heterogeneity so it's different you know, type sources, forms of geospatial data, 
And this is, this is pretty common for us, but these are concerns that are not really met by metadata standards, because if you um, try to marry data sets together, even if they are conformant in some schema, in some metadata schema, um, they may not actually mean the same things. Words or concepts in two different databases from two different sources may not actually mean the same thing. And this is not such a problem when you have one standard worldview that maps up the world, but it gets more complex. Um, so ontologies, they're regarded as, as this promising way to try to help meet this challenge of big earth data, is to try to map out meaning in a formalized way so that computers can understand relationships. So ontologies can broaden our scope um, by our scope of our models and their capacity to process data by improving um, the structure, the quality, uh, and adopting these representations of data mean that if it's a formalized set, just like any other standard, it's reusable, it's scalable, um, and it can perform like traditional models. And so on top, I should mention here, yeah, ontologies. Um, there, so yeah, okay, <laughs> many of you have probably seen this movie before. Uh, there's a common, uh, common misconception that the more data we feed in to a model, the better we're the better it will perform. If you work in modeling, you probably know this is not the case. Um, and sometimes too much data can be overwhelming um, and even counterproductive. So you've probably seen this meme before, um, AI trying to make a picture of what is salmon swimming downstream? This is very disturbing to me. Um, and it just tells you a little bit about um, just gives you the sense that if uh, meaning isn't it's very obvious to us that these are salmon flies and that fillet of salmon is fish, but it's very different than a live fish. But those explicit relationships have to be made um, for machines to understand them, and that's done in ontologies, um, developing these relationships. And they're becoming more and more common on the web. So there are these large taxonomies um, with sites like you, uh, Yahoo and Amazon. Um, as well as those that specify domains, and these are becoming more and more common in particular scientific domains. Um, so in reality, there's a pretty fine line between where an ontology ends and a knowledge base begins. So the idea of the semantic web is um, something like uh, W3C, a consortium is developing this RDF and OWL uh, encoded languages to try and um, make this something that's more broad scale over the internet. So the web pages um, are understandable by different electronic agents, different semantic web agents and semantic web services. And the idea is that um, AI will be able to make better meaning from the systems that we create. And it's not so much a relational database where one is connected to the other and it's their tree structure, but it actually has meaning imbued as we tell it. Uh, and this is very useful, of course, for, um, for many systems we want to be able to have for using these technologies. Um, I'll talk maybe about this in a minute, but we outsource a lot of uh, our capacity to technology. And if we're going to use that, if we're going to do use technology in this way, we want it to be smart, we want it to be useful. This is just one quick example that I'll I'll preface with a knowledge graph um, just to kind of get you thinking along these lines. A knowledge graph is semantic modeling uh, for data representation through, of course, defining these entities, concepts, semantic relations, as I talked about. Um, this is one example from a paper. Um, where information was formalized into an ontology based on uh, forest fire semantic rules. So experts from, and you'll see some of these nodal knowledge graphs as we come along, um, experts from the, from different domain fields, and you can see kind of on the, the bottom here where the data comes from, and then the knowledge extraction that happens from that, 
So I, I sort of just want you to have this in your mind to think about in different kinds of domains and different kinds of fields, who are those domain experts? Who are we relying on to give us the information that we are building an ontology, building meaning, meaning about? So yeah, like I, I mentioned, our technologically mediated world is already based on standardized conformant singular conceptualizations of reality that map out reality. And we're sort of on this, we'll talk about this in a moment, but we're on this runaway train of conformity. And this is how Gregory Bateson would frame it, um, that we have one worldview that really uh, all of our technological basis is built on. So formal ontologists argue that this is a good thing, right? If we take in more environmental information, more traditional ways of knowing um, and have those concepts into uh, the ontologies that are already built, this will enhance cross-cultural understanding, improved resource management. Um, however, little attention is paid to the broader impl implica implications of codifying, stabilizing, and analyzing indigenous knowledge as one example of local or traditional knowledge into a logical framework that's driven by scientific ideals um, or recognition of the destructive potential uh, for reduction of knowledge into a form that can be readily extracted from its own knowledge base and cultural context. Um, and we'll talk about how these are not so easily mapped one to one from one worldview to the other, or maybe that's not ethical to even do it. Um, rather than empowering local communities, this may um, result in a form of knowledge colonialism. So um, on the other hand, right, if we ignore that there are the, these other worldviews, these other ways of knowing and being and conceptualizing reality and interfacing with the environment in a way that, that management would be very different, um, if you ignore that, then you, again, leave people behind more and more and more if we're forging forward in one particular worldview. Uh, and you're seeing that a potential key knowledge construction that's happening as we do live in a technologically mediated world, you're leaving them out of um, information policy making processes. So as such, there are several collaborative uh, participatory formal ontology construction projects emerging and ongoing. So um, geocybernetics talks about space, place, and belonging. Uh, the problem with traditional uh, enterprise databases are that, you know, data tables stored in relational databases, um, you have to join them together to get meaning from them. Um, and this becomes utterly untenable when you have um, mapping out a knowledge base that's not um, looking just at a mechanistic view of nature and interactions and listing variables, um, but it also implicitly has to have relations to political, philosophical, emotional, existential, relational, anthropological, you know, all of these dimensions that must be mapped out, it becomes just impossible. And you can't query these tables with the kind of deep knowledge about all of these different dimensions of reality that are implicit in other knowledge systems. So conceptual ontology um, in geography attempts to understand how people think and how they organize geographical information with all of these different dimensions of knowledge overlaying. Um, and so a primary goal of geographic ontologies is to make make some of these explicit so that these knowledge systems uh, participate in the systems of modernity and technology that we've created. So space and place pay, play a really important role in indigenous knowledge systems. Um, and more and more GIS are really important in local, uh, local use of land resource and planning. Um, and it's a starting point and it has been used for many decades now as a starting point to link, to link local traditional um, indigenous knowledge with decision makers, even younger generations, uh, linking uh, multi-generations in a community and the scientific community together. And I'll reference um, through the talk this 
uh, a one one project from 2012 and some papers following from 2017 uh, or excuse me 2015 and a project of Inuit um, and some people here at Trent as well as uh, <coughs> my supervisor at Carlton uh, and a project to help the form decision making um, locally about the environment, land use, um, and potential development in that area. So it really came in response as it should uh, from a need for improved recognition of Inuit knowledge and formal decision making processes. And uh, their goals were among, among a few to develop this geospatial ontology application and interface. So it's newly conceptualized um, land classification system with NGIS. Um, that complements existing GIS land use planning, but also has um, this really complex transmission of different dimensions of reality that's necessary to take that worldview and, and help to, to give that voice in a larger framework. Um, and cyber cartography, I'll just mention um, quickly here, this is something, this is an image from uh, Nunalit Atlas, and Nunalit is a uh, free and open source software that, that the research group that I work with at Carleton has developed and it's been many using with communities for many years um, because it encompasses a uh, variety of forms of information, uh, different languages um, and symbols, place names, different types of media, um, and it integrates holistic, dynamic, interactive, um, multidiscipline. Um, it's an incredible platform that tries to help this um, information technology um, at the driving force of emerging new paradigms in cartography and other fields. So uh, yeah, just a few, a few things here about, um, before we talk about those, the nodal nature of those knowledge systems. Uh, practical reasons for constellating knowledge systems. Um, you may be familiar with the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. This is IPBES. Um, so this is a framework that was um, established by 94 member states, and it's developed. It was developed to strengthen science policy interface for biodiversity and ecosystem services. So this is just one example of um, a framework that's developed that give some at least recognition to the importance of um, what's called indirect provisions. And these are something like the dimensions that I've been talking about that are really important for indigenous and local communities. And these include relational, existential, spiritual value. These are closely related to cultural value. And at least in this report, they suggest that cultural preservation may pour, play a really important role in understanding ecosystem services and their scalability. Um, but in a really practice, so that's, that's in a very uh, formal sort of way, but in a really practical way. I mean, I think we all kind of know intuitively humans existing in place for thousands of years in a particular location, develop a symbiotic relationship with the environment. So that's not only crucial for human survival, but it's co-beneficial ecological balance and sustainability. This indirect ecosystem provisions, as it's called, you know, is really about understanding what the existential value is of land, plants, animal, and what that relationship, what the meaning of that relationship is. And the meaning of that relationship is more than just details about what um, the environment is or what it has to offer humans. Um, it's much, much more complex than that. So when we see a wealth of key information, it gets, it gets pretty weedy. Um, so when we talk about constellating to other knowledge systems, it's more than about what's really practical in ways that we can kind of step back and think about our own worldview as scientists and why we're doing the science we're doing and how it can actually make change and make difference and do good in the world. Um, there's this other piece that's really about justice and equity. So, <laughs> you know, and, and really in the practical, um, the practical side from my point of view, uh, constellating to knowledge systems are really um, about attending to the ecological mind 
meaning conceptualizations of the self in the natural world. And I just put this quote from um, Sheridan Longbow. If some of you are here from Trent, uh, I wanted to make mention of Dan Longbow, who's pretty, um, he's been pretty fundamental in the Indigenous Sciences Department here at Trent. Um, and they say in this paper, uh, just a, a few things to, to sort of understand a little bit about this ecological mind and this different conceptualization. Um, they say, uh, conceits purporting to imagination having a purely human origin are consistent with preferences for exclusively human environments. Um, spiritual and intellectual integrities achieved on Turtle Island by the interplay of human and more than human consciousness. The experience of imagination is minding all things. And that is a conservation of all things. And all things comprise the indigenous mind. The indigenous mind is composed of all things. And this is to say that, um, I think I'll talk about this in a few slides. Should I, in the, in the interest of time? Yeah, you know, let's get ahead. <laughs> okay, so um, I think that it's, it's important at this point, and we'll talk in a few slides about some protocols that, that we can consider in our research in terms of engagement. Uh, but thinking of, is it appropriate, ethical, or possible to, to build ontologies on a verse concept, diverse conceptualization? So can we build meaning, technological structures of meaning from other worldviews and other knowledge systems? Um, if we do this, it, you know, and if we engage indigenous communities in any of our work, we must consider that there are practical um, concerns. You know, indigenous communities are often way overcommitted. They have too many asks. They're asked um, <laughs> in, in a lot of ways. Um, we're asking for help in decolonizing our own minds without that recognition. So it's a big burden. Um, that sometimes is asked. So there are practical concerns, there are economic concerns, legal, ethical concerns um, in mobilizing community data for decision making. And these specifically pertain to indigenous perspectives and rights. Um, and there are many international frameworks um, that we can talk about in a moment. While it is true that um, we can't be neutral on a moving train, and we are all participating in these structures of reconciliation and decolonization. So this is important really for all of us to be thinking about. Um, but we should recognize explicitly in our research that data and research has not represented indigenous peoples. It's not told their stories. It's not been driven by their narratives. There's lack of control and there's historical and ongoing lack of indigenous data infrastructure, um, support and funding. Uh, so, and I'll just mention UN Drip here and say that um, the right to self-determination goes beyond social and political development and includes real-time knowledge and data in all of its forms. And I'm just going to go through quickly here a few, uh, a few examples of protocols that can be used. Um, and you know, there's this real, there's this real problem, first of all, the problem, maybe I'll mention this again, but the problems of semantics here are large, um, large. The terms and expressions of uh, indigenous languages, the interpretations of the world uh, that they have that I call conceptualizations, they don't translate well um, to modern English or conceptualizations of the world. Maybe they can't. Um, but to help us enter into an era of co-design, um, and working with people of other knowledge systems, these protocols have been developed and implemented. And this is, uh, these are some protocols from ICC. You can read through these. First of all, uh, it's really important and it's an easy one to remember and to carry with you. Nothing about us without us. And of course, we're, we're probably all pretty familiar with FAIR principles, findable, accessible, interoperable 
interoperable and reusable hand in hand with that are care principles. So um, be fair and care, it's collective benefit, authority to control, responsibility and ethics. And the last couple of slides, I'll talk a little bit about responsibility. And there's some more information here about, uh, about care principles, which you're welcome to, to look over. And uh, OCAP, which you're probably all familiar with here in Ontario or probably beyond, um, OCAP uh, asserts that First Nations alone have control over their data, um, the collection of their data in their communities, that they own and control this information and how it can be stored, how it can be interpreted, how it can be used, how it can be shared. So, um, I'll go, I'll step back just a little bit and I'm going to use the rest of my time to talk about um, the fun stuff, which is actually thinking about mapping ontologies and <laughs> what that might look like and what that might look like for my research, which I'm very excited about. But I wanted to, um, to leave this quote up here from Stephanie Perrin. She worked at uh, my research group at GCRC and she was a leader of the residential school land memory atlas. So this is one of the several cartographic atlases uh, based on the free and open source and the framework that I that I uh, mentioned earlier from GCRC. Um, but this, I love this quote. I use it all the time. She says, "Cartography is in the midst of an ontological crisis." So this means, you know, there's a radical transformation that's happening away from a focus on representation, communication, and objectivity toward performance, reflexivity, and narrative. So I think that we all know this in cartography and we're all kind of feeling this in our science that there's this real turn. We're being asked for science communication, basically. Something that's agile, reflexive, that reflects the needs of multitudinous individuals and ways of knowing and being. Um, in short, a relational approach to understanding, she says. So the new moral consciousness that attends this transformation is characterized by an overarching preoccupation, preoccupation with promoting justice, which includes the enhancement and agency of, of agency and empowerment, especially with those people who have been historically subjugated to mm -hmm. colonial authority, um, which is a considerable part um, been justified by colonial maps. Um, and I'll just mention quickly that I didn't include this slide in here, but I was giving uh, a talk for Dr. Fraser Taylor, who uh, runs GCRC and has uh, started, started that center. Uh, I was giving a talk on based on a paper that he did at a UN session, and he very pointedly, he, <laughs> we had a, a slide that uh, pointed um, toward, it said colonial cartography, just to, to not to be inflammatory, but just to, and, and this is at a UN session speaking heads of state and national acting organizations, just to kind of clue people in and say, let's talk openly about this language and that the maps we've been using um, are delineated in this very colonial way. Okay. So um, we've talked about the approaches in, um, I've showed some slides in approaches in participatory mapping and cyber cartography, like the work at DCRC um, and the guiding principles and protocols that are used. There are many successful use cases of working with um, and developing uh, technological solutions for communities, particularly in environmental monitoring and assessment and management, um, but a, a real step is to, uh, maybe a second step after engagement is to understand the rich processes that indigenous peoples relate to their environment and how that rich information can be mapped. Um, and just as one example, um, working with people in analyzing remote sensing data, the, and if you're using that, as your training data, it's far more reliable um, than machine learning. And because it's so rich, it's so multi and it relates to many other things. So it's really superior uh, 
quality of data when you work with people on the front. This is pretty intuitive for us. And as I said, um, this participatory GIS, uh, this is actually from the uh, project that I mentioned earlier that really sought uh, geospatial ontology research methods and uh, cr to create useful tools to illustrate and communicate the indigenous knowledge, um, working with the Inuit people of this project and their concepts of the environment um, and which the local people understand exceptionally well. Um, and it's very rich data. And you can see this kind of nodal network. And this is an example of a sort of mind map or relational map between different concepts and different nodes. And those also have a geographical component. So uh, they're mapped out geographically, but many different nodes of meaning and value associated with any particular point in geography. It's really complex relationships. So yeah, these, from this and other studies, this local knowledge yields really high quality data with the systems mapping approach. So, you know, like I said, it maps the relationships among environmental variables um, and knowledge with broader implications, um, and which really helps to understand the data for actionable mitigation strategies. So it incorporates, you know, many different variables into the analysis, including cultural provisions, biodiversity indicators, um, local economic stability and resilience, intrinsic value indicators um, that aren't typically uh, delineated very well by Western scientific methods. Um, and of course, like I said, again, this is a real problem that they ran into with using just relational databases is that the relationships are complex. They're not easily stored in a database. They can be really difficult to visualize that way. The relationships are not hierarchical, but they're interrelated to each other. Um, and to add to these challenges, the relationships between things don't have a simple, this means this. Um, this is uh, a component of the environment and it only has one relationship. It means one thing and it's sort of a general tree structure is what we typically see. Um, and those relationships have to be considered when any of these nodes expand, um, they have many different meanings. So you click on any of these nodes and it expands more and more and more and more um, and makes this really complex, rich uh, representation of the meaning. Um, and they were left from this project and still the need remains to develop advanced connectedness and a centrality model that uses graph theory and others to think about how nodes are collapsed, how they relate together, um, and really a new ontology model that's reflexive and can be adaptable um, for different knowledge systems. And the same thing was found from the Consortium on Data, uh, Arctic Data Interoperability, that a data infrastructure uh, ecosystem is really necessary with uh, socio-technological interrelated parts and system think systems thinking is required for this kind of uh, design for, in for understanding the different kinds of phenomena. So, and bridging the gap between, this is another study that, uh, that sort of outlined bridging the gap, uh, the geospatial gap um, about indigenous knowledge of place and space. Uh, they found that there were a few factors, of course, uh, overrepresentation of digital data about space rather than knowledge of place, which is pretty common, right? <laughs> pretty common in our sciences. We have a lot of information about something, but not a not lot of knowledge about that place um, to support that data. Um, and lack of uh, differentiating knowledge um, with indigenous data sovereignty uh, and lack of relationship. So, so this study also uh, suggested that um, identifying te technological opportunities could offer this um, pragmatic pathway instead of bootstrapping, you know, uh, other approaches together that we've been using, kind of move beyond technological fixes and develop something new. So just bringing back in the, 
this idea of the semantic web. So, you know, again, the, the semantic web would is, is starting to and does allow AI to make use of data. It's really smart data. It forms the basis of autonomous decision making from, um, from AI. It mediates how data is represented in space and place. And it gives representation of knowledge, whatever that looks like to us. However, we've told the systems, this is, this is what things mean. It gives us that representation of knowledge. So from all of these, these studies that have been done and the suggestions that have been made about what needs to happen moving forward, how can we actually diversify? Um, maybe an anti-web is something we need, you know, leaving space for diverse conceptualizations of meaning, space for the ecological mind. Um, what different kind of internet could exist? Could exist, you know, if this is um, more of a systems thinking approach where a really strong and resilient system is a diverse one, just like our gut biome, for example. Um, you cannot have a, multi, uh, a monoculture and expect that to be resilient. It's incredibly fragile. Um, and in systems thinking, a strong, a strong system, a strong structure comes from many different autonomous nodes in that structure that are interrelated and work together but work autonomously. Uh, it doesn't mean that uh, the structure can be shared in many ways, but it can also be agile. Different nodes um, can have their own closed data system and their own closed knowledge and choose to share what they want, um, or others can have completely open data and open technologies and open technological structures. Uh, an alternative digital world that has these multi-different nodes these multi-different conceptualizations and ontologies built into meaning um, might give control back to diverse conceptualizations, give control back to different ways of knowing and being in communities and limiting the process of uh, this escalating runaway conformity that we have in technology. So this can mean an array of tools that are built on a decentralized model like I just described. Um, and it might create the kinds of the right kinds of checks and balances in a system um, by intentionally meeting the precise points where those have been bypassed or eliminated, like ethics and morality and indigenous ways of knowing. By meeting those explicitly, um, we might be able to find a way to bring back in checks and balances to our system that Bateson just talked about. So, um, just a few things to wrap up here. Uh, I'd recommend checking out this website. Um, I was gonna follow these links, but we don't need to do that. You can do that if you like. Uh, this is a really cool site, Indigenous AI. This was based apparently on a workshop that was done. And there's a blog you can read just uh, a few. Uh, it's all Indigenous people from all over the world and um, their work on AI and their, their conceptualizations of this. Uh, and it's very, very interesting and um, highly recommended. And then I found this other, it's a, it's a bit old, it's uh, from 2015, and I couldn't find any information about it. So I don't know if anything came out of this grant or not, but uh, it was out of Australia uh, and the grant was for indigenizing semantic web. So um, ontologies for indigenous knowledge, um, heritage resources for uh, machine readable web. So I think I just wanted to make note of that because in closing, um, you know, there are a few things that, if I'll go to this slide first, um, a few things that we can do. Uh, so it's clear that technologies like the semantic web and AI, it, it's really, I think it's pretty easy to be afraid of them in some circles or demonize uh, technologies. Of course, these aren't inherently bad, the risks, the, the risks we introduce um, and the risks are in how we implement and manage them or don't manage them. It's how we build them or choose not to build them or don't have the awareness of how we're building them. Um, and the challenges that we have is responsibility gap. Making progress on important fronts, including you know, environment, technology, governance, decolonization requires that we address 
this responsibility gap, you know, and everyone can do that in every field. Um, it doesn't matter what you're doing. You can rethink where does my information come from? What's the knowledge that I'm trying to, that's arising from it that I'm calling knowledge? And what worldview does that come from? How, what is that couched in? How can we constellate to different ways of knowing and being to branch out and make it more actionable? Um, and meeting this responsibility gap, yeah, you can seek out resources. You can seek out good work already being done in your field by people of other worldviews. Um, support indigenous scientists and scholars. Uh, advocate for just funding mechanisms. You know, like the one that we looked at there from Australia, and there are many. Um, there are even in Canada arising some some fundamental differences in how funding is allocated at the national level. Um, to communities as well as through academia. Um, respect data sovereignty and, and protocols. And in um, using more diverse conceptualizations in work, if we were to decolonize tech, um, I think that it really calls us to decolonize our own thinking. Um, it's been said that, that humanity has a fundamental wound and that, that was really killing the ecological mind ways of living with the land and understanding ourselves um, as intimately part of the systems that we live with. Um, so accepting a few more things here, accepting the value of indigenous knowledge is important and co-creation is important, but, and it's in the right direction, but it's often not good enough. Um, beyond engagement, there's a lack of diversity of conceptualizations in tech. Um, other ways of knowing and being in the technological architecture we use and develop, they are not there or they are pretty scarce. Um, and the perspective that we take is that tech, data, modeling, mapping, first and foremost should really meet the needs of communities. Um, and forethought about ownership, control, potential damage um, is very important. Um, and and Acknowledgement about where these things, if where ownership lies, not with academics um, who have a secondary role to play, but really um, whoever is providing the, the data and information. And I think I'll just leave it with one more thing here. This is an image of the Celtic wheel. So, you know, my life's work is to. Uh, Going back to that slide from um, uh, about myself and this life change, my life's work is really to support people who support the land. Um, but this, you know, takes me back to my Celtic ancestors and the maps they left. And this is a Celtic will of the year. This is a map that um, that the ancestors left for us to navigate our way through the natural environment. It's an interface. Um, it shows the, the seasons and describes how to move with the seasons, move through the seasons. And it's one representation of this, um, of a type of technology, right? Like a, a moral, ethical technology, a wisdom system. So, you know, it really does make me think about the maps that, we've, that we already have. What maps do we already have and we're not even using? What if we integrated this human nature interaction from wisdom traditions and diverse conceptualization of land um, and life-centered technology instead of um, maybe an economic-centered uh, model that we have more now, particularly when we think about uh, conceptualizations of ecosystem services and nature-based services. How do we you know, put nature on an economic ledger um, how can we step back and think about centralizing life um, from some other maps that we've been left with? So, uh, you know, systems thinking just allows us to critically at, at the very basis, critically examine what are our ontological architectures, what are our worldviews, what are other pe people's worldviews, um, and what would happen if nature was a relationship <coughs> You know, that, that relationship is what really built the basis of our technological systems. And so, yeah, with that, I think I'm just going to leave you. How do we do what we do? And also, 
um, I, I still have this very deep love for Mars and um, Mars science. And so this is what it's like. If you're a Mars rover sitting on Mars, that's what we look like out there. That's, uh, it's not exactly the pale blue dot out there in the, in the, in the beam out in the cosmos, but I think it's, it's pretty important perspective. You know, we, all of the things we've talked about today, right? All of these diverse conceptualizations, you know, put it in a heady, a heady way, you know, it's all just sitting right there and it's, and it's pretty precious. So I'll leave it there. We have a few minutes. Please, let's, let's, uh, let's pick Christy's brain while we have her. And uh, if there's anybody on the line who has questions, please throw your hand up and I'll, I'll call on you. But we will start with Linda. I'm going to ask the first question. Thanks very much, Christy. Um, yeah, I, for me, your, your message is that, you know, as statisticians develop their modeling, um, maybe to inform a lot of the world's challenges uh, now and, and in the future. As we start to engage more with machine learning and AI, that one of the dangers that we're going is much like you might have realized in developing a large rover, is that we face a real lot of autonomous future. <coughs> a lot of sensors and Earth observational data and all the models guiding decision making. And, um, and that may be an economic reason, that may be a simplicity of all these complex technologies, right? It's, it's a simple answer to solving problems. But Ultimately, we have to be think about how we take our models that actually make positive decisions that really are used by communities and people to inform their decisions and to take better actions. Like we've had a few talks on uh, you know, child malnutrition. And so I guess in that sort of my understanding of, of what you're trying to relate to statisticians and modelers, what would how would you put all that sort of what would be your advice to say that a young student, a <coughs> undergrad student, who's learning about statistics and what variables to choose, whether to involve non traditional data sources, uh, geospatial data? What would be your advice to them? Um, yeah, thank you so much, Nathaniel. Um, beautiful questions, as always. I think it's really tough in the structures we've created right, because they're pretty siloed. Um, but for me, maybe it goes back to just curiosity and um, asking better questions. You know, if we're thinking about what are the what are the metrics uh, that we are interested in, uh, what are the the details, what are the data types, what's the data we're interested in compiling, um, those questions maybe have to be asked by the people that are immediately affected, immediately affected by hunger. I, I don't know that there are some straightforward answers about how to connect to those people, but I think, I think asking those questions and pushing forward and really thinking about the people that I'm interested <coughs> in helping, um, you know, and part of decolonization is breaking down this thinking that we, we need to come in and help. And, and instead asking better questions about populations that are affected that we're concerned about, you know, and if it's, it's tougher when it's a broader question, but it does take, I think, a little bit more event investigation about what the root causes are um, and maybe focusing more on place is better specific place where there's specific concerns, where those can be met in a specific way instead of a general way. We get caught a lot in trying to generalize too much. Um, and if those better questions are asked in a place sort of way um, about specifically what the needs are, maybe that's a good place to start in, in modeling. But, hi, thanks. That was uh, really, really interesting. Um, so, so for me, one of the foundational quotes, like a statistical model in a, a foundational way, I think is that you know, all models are wrong, it's not a useful George Box, famous quote. And, and I like that quote because when they say useful, it connects it to value systems. 
Um, so it's very clear that we're modeling that to try and take some perfect representation of the system, the activity, keep in mind what it's going to be used for uh, in the coexistence analysis. And then I guess, I guess my question that connects to that is, you know, when, when you build, say, if you show some plots from formal ontologies that have been built using indigenous, indigenous knowledge, like, how do you even, what, what, what are you going to use it for? You know, so how, how do you think about that question? What is this useful for? Because you know that when you take that knowledge out of people's minds and try and represent it in a formal system, you, you've just lost lots of important details. And, and we, we always know this when we build the model that we're ignoring things. So, so how do you, how do you think about that in the context of a formal ontology? I hope that question is somewhat clear. Yeah, I, as, I, as I'm interpreting it, at least, this is where um, co-design and co-development is crucial. Sure. Um, because, you know, there's this, uh, it's just a very different way of running a project when um, instead of saying, okay, here's a problem, here's a potential solution, let's work on it together, let's develop, um, let's develop a model. Uh, it's, you know, sitting down and working with people for maybe many months and asking what the needs are. So, so you're know. saying, what are we developing and why are we developing exactly what is the use case, how will it be used, and work together stepwise in figuring out what components are needed and what players are needed who needs to be involved um, to build that structure, to build, if it's building, you know, an ontology that a database sits on top and then model sits on top of that and an interface on top of that and, and different people from community or any other players come in to use that interface, all feeding information into it and getting information out of it um, in terms of you know, something like a conservation management scheme. Um, it depends on specifically, yeah, what they're interested in. Are we, are we interested in um, food scarcity and a food source and how that's managed and how the land is managed, how other species are, around it are managed? Um, and how, how does everyone participate? Maybe this, does that answer your question? It's, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's complex, but maybe it's about really co-development in the beginning and asking these questions about what the specific needs are um, being targeted. Not that all the information is going to be mapped adequately sure. or can, or maybe, you know, ethically, could we try to fit that, squeeze that into some technological frame? I don't know. All right, we're at 10. So let's pick Christy's brain over coffee. <laughs> Thank you again, Christy.